morning. We have several announcements today. Most of them are on the back or on the next to last page of your bulletin. It said we would like to uh, appreciate everyone that are first time visitors to sign the friendship register, passing it down so that they'll have a chance to uh, register attendance, please. And it says we are hosting soup and more dinner this evening at the Presbyterian Church beginning at two o'clock and clean up at seven. Now, I was told earlier, was it four o'clock, Jan? Yeah, um, that's for eating. Pardon me? That's for eating part. Oh, just for eating purpose. Preparations at two, so everybody be there at two. Uh, and stay till seven to clean up. The meal is served between four and six. All are welcome uh, to join the fun. Uh, tonight's movie is the movie called Up. I understand that it was very good. I heard from one of the ladies earlier. And it'll be held in the parking lot at 8.30 p.m. Jack said there is a sign-up sheet. And if you want to be picked up, you are to uh, by the bus, you are to sign the sheet on the bulletin board in the parlor. The van will pick up at 7.45. You bring your chairs and blankets and join us for lots of fun. And it says, join us for another gathering of Spirit Sisters at Diamond Dave's on Monday, August the 1st at 7 p.m. Come one, come all, and bring a friend with you. And the First Christian Church Book Club meets Thursday, August the 4th at 11.30 a.m., I would assume. <laughs> uh, the Disciples' Breakfast, Men's Breakfast Group, meets at 8 a.m. I understand that's very good and that you don't want to miss that on August the 6th at the Old Dairy. And... Uh, Let's see, I believe Bob has something that he would like to say at this time. I only need 10 minutes. <laughs> well. I just want everybody to know I've got great sweet corn. I was after church. It was last week right here next to church. Like, please stop, because I don't want to hold it home. I got facts. But once we get more, stop in. Thank you, Bob, very much. I'm sure people will be happy to get that. Uh, we will now start with our uh, prelude. Well, sure. I just want to remind everyone that there is a congregational meeting immediately after church. I promise you there is one item, and it will be done in 15 minutes. So I uh, just want to make sure everybody stays. Well, thank you for saying that. That was one of them I forgot to tell you about. Uh, so we'll start with our prayer lude with Carol Harmon. Thank you.
Let us prepare our hearts and mind for our worship. Would everybody please stand that are able to repeat. Welcome all who feel distant or separated from God. Welcome all who have tried to be faithful, yet still search for God's presence. Welcome all who long to live the ways of God, revealed in Jesus Christ. God is here in this place and time. Let us worship our just and grateful God. Our opening hymn will be page 23. We're saying the first and third verses. Page 23. join with me in the evocation. God of constant faithfulness, how grateful we are for this opportunity to worship you and to find renewal in your presence. Open our ears to hear your word this day. Open our eyes to see the world as you see it. Open our hearts that we might walk eagerly in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll have the children's moment. everyone well good morning guys I think I heard one person let's try that again good morning that's eh, a little better <clears throat> now just by a show of hands who here knows what kindness is well we're gonna learn aren't we <laughs> now for I think the two hands that I saw what were some times that someone was kind to you Okay, so when people help you in class, I think. Was that your hand over there, Griffin? What's, someone, what's a time that someone was kind to you? What was that? Uh, opened a door for you? Okay. <laughs> well, for me, one of these times that someone was kind to me was when I had just moved to Macomb, and I didn't know a whole lot of people. I was in a new place, right? I had also made a mistake with some of my registration stuff, nothing that you guys really care about too much, but what it meant was that I couldn't get food the first few days. Now, on that first day, I went into the dining hall. I was all nervous because everything was all new and different. I hurriedly grabbed, you know, whatever I could grab for food, and I went to the checkout line, and the nice checkout lady told me that apparently I wasn't a student. 
<clears throat> so, to be honest, I was a little embarrassed. Now, thankfully, the person behind me in line offered to pay for me, and that ended up being one of my best friends that year. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? Now, all of these Emilys with people helping in class and holding doors for people, all of these are pretty good ways that people can show kindness, right? I think it's important that we remember just how important being kind and compassionate to those around us is. You know that warm, fuzzy feeling we get when someone is kind to us? It's something that we can pass along, no matter the circumstance. It's an important part of our faith, and it's even an important part of just being a person, right? I forget where I heard it, but I do remember hearing somewhere that just one act of kindness can start a chain reaction of lots of people being kind to each other. Wouldn't that be nice? Now, you know how you can start that chain reaction? You want to take one and pass it down? <clears throat> I've got a way right here for you. These are little thank you cards. After service today, I want each of you to find someone to give one of these cards to and tell them why you're thankful for them. Okay, everyone got one? Thank you. Okay, let's pray, guys. <clears throat> Dear Lord, help us to go from this place today with a little more kindness and compassion for others in our hearts. Please help guide us to those who might need a little more kindness in their lives and help us to be the ones to start the chain reaction of kindness that it might eventually reach everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tad. You're welcome, Kelly. <laughs> this morning, we have someone who has returned to church for the first time in a while. Some of you might be wondering if I'm going to call on you. <laughs> but I'm going to call on Betty Ayton, who wants to say something to us all. morning. She's on the mic. Just a I'm second, Betty. With me. We're ready. Uh, I'm Betty Ayton, and I've been a member of the church here for 60 years plus. And uh, there's a lot of new faces in this time that probably don't know me. But I haven't been here for three months. I fell and broke my neck and had to have surgery with a trans bone transplant and through that three months it's been a miraculous recovery yes, sir. and uh, uh, so many people from the church have prayed sent cards sent emails and they were all deeply appreciated <coughs> my family and I my daughter's here with me today Luann my son it lives in Mississippi so he couldn't be here but we all want to thank each and every one of you and God bless you Thank you, Betty. It is miraculous that you are here this day and that you are doing so well, and we're so grateful that you've been able to be here. Luann, um, you have been amazing through this time. I know that you would say that, Betty. You've been amazing to your mom, so thanks for all your steadfastness and all your um, work to be with your mom and taking care of her, just as she took care of you so many years ago. And um, so we just appreciate both of you being here this day. So welcome back. That's what we're going to say. And we'll be seeing you from here on, right? Well, I, I probably won't see you here. Well, that's all right. We'll see you soon, though. That's all that matters. So welcome back, Betty. And, and just thanks for saying thanks to us. But thanks for getting better. That's all we care about. And thanks be to God for God's part in all of that, right? Um, I would share with you that... Um, she is not here this day, but Ellen Tingley is um, about to move, 
And so if you have a chance to drop a phone call or to drop a, drop a phone call, how do you drop a phone call? That's, that's not really what you want to do. Hi, Ellen. Boom. No, that's not what. Uh, you might want to give her a call or write her a note just to say good luck in her move. She's moving to be closer to her daughter in the Bloomington Normal area. And so we just wish she and Ted well on their move and um, keep them in our prayers as they make that transition. If you've moved, you know how difficult that can be, whether it's across town or to a new community. And so we just pray for Ellen and Ted. For those of you who've been a part of our prayer chain, you know that Stan Mercer has um, received an initial report on his brain surgery, and it is cancer. We're still waiting to know the severity, and um, they think level two or three is what she put in her notes. Um, she is amazing with her spirit and with her faithfulness, and, and uh, so we keep Stan and Debbie in our prayers as they continue to walk down this path and to get a, a, a more final diagnosis as they move forward. We pray for Jan Rockwell's sister, Sue Boyer, who has entered hospice care and is in the final stages of ovarian cancer. Jan, for you and all your family, we pray. Um, Jack McKinnon's sister, Linda, he just went to teach children's church. She's being released from the hospital today after a very long stay, but things are good. She's too healthy to go to the rehab that they thought she was going to go to. She's too healthy to remain in the hospital, but she still is just not feeling great and not having a, um, a good diagnosis. They have made a diagnosis, but they're unsure of that diagnosis, and so she is going home, though, and we pray for that and that that will all go well as she will start to receive a lot of care in her home, and, and so we're thankful that she's leaving the hospital, and we're so prayerful for more um, health, good health to come. We pray for Gina Montgomery, a young woman in our church who is in Peoria dealing with some cancer in her leg, and uh, she had a fall this week, which caused some swelling around that cancerous area, and she was um, a little dehydrated uh, to go along with the radiation therapy that she's receiving, and not a good combination of things, but she seems to be doing better now, but in the middle of the week, that was a, a very difficult and scary time. She was admitted into the hospital for one night, and uh, Janelle, her mother, would appreciate your prayers as well, so let's keep Gina and Janelle and Jim in our prayers received an email early in the week from Karen Chatterton about a friend of her daughter, Holly. His name is Robbie Crawford, and he is um, having some difficulties with a gallbladder surgery. He's been in and out of the hospital several times in the last few weeks. So we keep Robbie in our prayers. And also then, um, Betty Durant, that's your aunt, right, Karen? Uh, who is Betty? It's uh, our sister-in-law's mother. That's who it is. Um, sister-in-law's mother. And she is 98 years old. Her mind is good, but her body is beginning to fail her. So we keep Betty and family in prayer. Also, thank you for helping me remember who she was to you. Uh, Ruth Parks, a good friend to our church and most of the community, um, is at Wesley. She had a bit of a hospital stay this week. She's gone to Wesley for rehab. And so we pray for Ruth and all of her family. This morning, Linda Ward shared with me that her daughter, Angel Dubray, did I say that right? Um, had a motorcycle wreck in Oklahoma. Um, she fought the deer, and the deer won. Um, and so we're thankful that she walked away from that. Well, kind of walked away from that. She's got some um, issues with her legs, but um, after time of healing, she'll be fine. So we're grateful that she is alive and well and taking care of her family, even though she feels like she can't do that as well with the leg not working as well but we're grateful for the outcome. Those who have been in our prayers and continue to be in our prayers, Ann Schrader, Melissa Inman, Jim Ray, and Martin Alvarado. We come into this moment to breathe. We've heard a lot of news of other folks, and we have our own news. Some of it too personal to share, some of it seemingly too petty to share, but it is our news. Let us bring our whole selves to our God. Let us take a moment to begin this morning prayer in silence, to breathe, to center on God, to find God's presence with us in this holy place on this beautiful Sunday. Let us pray.
compassionate, loving God. We bring our total selves to you this day. As individuals, as a church, we bring our hearts and our souls to you. We lay them open to you right now, hoping to connect with you, hoping to feel your presence for the things that we celebrate this day. We're so glad that you celebrate with us for the things that we mourn and grieve this day. We're grateful that you care and comfort, that you will come and put an arm around us, that you will remind us that we are not alone. Encourage us this day to know your presence and strengthen us this day to accept your love for us. Too often we run from you. Too often we want to say no to you. This day, turn us around. Make us your people, bring us close. We come here each week to honor and to bless you, God. We come here each week in hopes of being stronger for you. It takes courage to walk out these doors, to live in this world as a person of faith, a believer, a follower of Christ. It takes strength for so many want to beat us down, want to remind us that you're not real. We know different. But sometimes it's hard to show what we know. So this day, may we find the strength and the courage that we need to be able to go beyond these walls, that your love can live through us, that your kindness can live through us, that your compassion can be extended to others in need through us. Yes, you are a compassionate and loving God. Instill these same characteristics into us your people. We pray this day in the name of the one who is the center of our faith. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples and even us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
<laughs> it's good when your son is your biggest fan. We're all fans too, aren't we? Let the people of God say amen. amen. That was great. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Carol. Our scripture today comes from the prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. It is printed in the bulletin if you'd like to read. If you'd like to listen along, that is just fine as well. Let us hear the word this day. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet I, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness and bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up after all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion when he roars. His children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes. Thus says the Lord. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. One of my favorite storytellers is William Wright. William White, and he writes a story called Compassion. One day, three elderly gentlemen go out to the teacher. They leave their village, and they go to where the teacher is, and they go to the teacher. Each one of them gets an individual audience. The first says, teacher, make me a fishing net. And the teacher says, no, I won't do that for you today. The second man says, Teacher, for the monastery, so that we will have something that comes from your hand. Make me a fishing net. And the teacher says, I don't have time to make you a fishing net. The third man comes to the teacher. This man has a past. He has a bad reputation within the community. This man comes to the teacher and says, Teacher, make me a fishing net. And the teacher says, For you, I will make a fishing net. The day goes on, and later in the day, the two men who were refused by the teacher pull him aside, and they say to him, why was it that you made a fishing net for him and not for us? And the teacher said, well, when I said to you that I didn't have time to make a fishing net, neither of you were disappointed. But this man who has a past, this man who has a bad reputation, if I had refused him, he would have thought in his mind, well, he knows of my past. He has heard my story. He didn't make me a fishing net because of my reputation. Well, that would have been bad. That would have been a stumbling block for our relationship. But as it is, he goes away happy. And we can relate more going forward. And then the teacher said this at the end. Sometimes we have to have special rules for our weaker friends. 
What do you think of that? Is that a, a standard or a principle that you would like to see debated on a political stage? Is that something you'd like to see debated at a biblical debate? So much of our inclination, there's so much that's ingrained in us as Americans. You have to fight for everything and you keep what is yours. We hear that a lot, don't we? But the teacher says, sometimes we have to extend ourselves, especially for those who need a bit more. Isn't that what God does for us? Each and every one of us. The book of Hosea is a great book. It's one of those prophetic books, which means it's about the prophet Hosea. Prophets have one job. Their job is to speak the word of God to the people of God. This is what every prophet's job is, no matter if it's one of the big prophets or one of the minor prophets. Hosea is kind of somewhere in between, but would be considered one of the more minor prophets. It's a book that is maybe 12 or so chapters in length, and it's about this prophet who marries a woman, and they have children together, and their life as a married couple becomes the relationship that God has with the Israelites, and it's not a good one. The woman's name is Gomer. Don't hearken back to 1960s TV. And it's not Gomer Pyle. <laughs> Gomer, and they have children, and they are wayward. The wife is wayward. The children are wayward. And Hosea, like any good prophet, rants and raves about these relationships and what they look like when it comes to the Israelites' relationships with God. He says, often in the first three chapters in referring to his relationship with Gomer, that you who are unfaithful to God are going to be turned away by God. You will return back to slavery. O oh, people of Israel, remember your history. When you were in good covenant with God, when you were in good relationship with God, things were good. You had your own country. You had a special relationship. You could grow your crops. You could live in your own land. Things were good. Do you remember your history before that time, before you had your promised land in Israel? You were enslaved, but God released you. This is the reason you should remain in covenant. This is the reason you should remain in right relationship because God released you from slavery. You are God's chosen people. Act like it. Chapters 4 through 11 begin to turn more attention to the children of Gomer and Hosea, the wayward, sinful, unfaithful children. And it culminates in this chapter, chapter 11, these verses which we read. Israel, my son. Ephraim, my son. Now, Israel, we understand. But who is Ephraim? Ephraim has an older brother named Manasseh. And Manasseh and Ephraim are the sons of Joseph. You remember Joseph? The one who got the Israelites out of a time where they couldn't grow their crops because there was famine. They were moved to the best part of Egypt and life was good. Joseph served as kind of a general, if you will, second in charge of all of Egypt. And his family was moved into the best part of Egypt where they could grow crops and their animals could flourish and they could grow their family. A family who had a special promise from God. It goes back to the times before slavery. Ephraim, being the youngest, also got the blessing from his grandfather, which should have gone to Manasseh. 
we can talk about that another time. But for those of you who know a little more of your Bible, that also happened one other time, right? Where a youngest got a blessing. It's an interesting story and an interesting part of Israelite history, but really kind of unimportant to our story today. What's important to our story today is that Ephraim, like all the, tr the tribes of Israel, all the tribes of Israel are named after the children of respected leaders, part of this family. And so in Israel, when they finally get to the promised land, there's this little area. We would think of it maybe like a county, the county of Ephraim. This is where all the people who were raised under that name lived. They were appointed a space. And so when Hosea writes or speaks on behalf of God and says, Ephraim and Israel, my son, talking about God, saying that these are God's sons, it is an intimate relationship with chosen people who are supposed to have right relationship, to live well with God. Here in the 11th chapter, God says, I'll send them back to Egypt. I'll send them back to slavery. I'll send them back so the Assyrians can rule them with the sword. God's angry. God's disappointed. Any of us who have ever been children understand that. We've had a parent angry at us. We've had a parent disappointed in us, more than likely, if you've been a parent, you know these parental feelings of disappointment and anger as well. God, the parent of Ephraim and Israel, is at wit's end. But then God says... But then God says, I can't do that. I can't do that to my children. My heart is welling up inside of me. My compassion and my love grow strong. I will not come in wrath. And as I take care of my children, they will come back to me. They will follow me in my glory and in my power. I will lead them back home. I will lead them back home. When God says that, it's a return to that promised land. It's a return to that special time and place where the children of God lived well in the ways of God. Compassion isn't only for God. Compassion is for us. But God says, well, I'm no mortal. I'm no human, I'm God. And we listen to that and we say, well, that's right, God is God. God can do amazing things, but we're human. We're pretty horrible people sometimes. We don't have to live up to those standards of God. We can get mean, we can get angry, and we can do that any place and time that we want. And I know that's a little exaggerated. But you've seen angry and wrathful people You've seen hateful and mean people, whether at political conventions or in a line at the grocery store, whether in your home or in your neighborhood, whether in line at the DMV or at the table in a restaurant with a server. You've seen people not act with kindness and compassion and we give ourselves an out because we're bad. I don't believe that, by the way. I don't believe that principle. As people who are of faith, we are supposed to live more like God. 
we are supposed to bring more of God's goodness into the world. And the reason that I don't necessarily go with some who want to say that people are evil and bad and horrible is because in Genesis, God says, I create you from my own being. I create you with my own essence. And if we, as people of faith, will pay attention to that, realizing that we have God within us, that God is inside of us, then doesn't it make sense that we should live more in the ways of compassion and faith and love and grace than hatefulness and spitefulness and meanness? That's what I believe. But too often, we forget God within us. Too often, we're like the children of Israel who are wayward, who neglect that right relationship, who no longer live in the promised land. I have two friends, Jim Mulholland and Philip Gulley, they wrote a book several years ago called If Grace is True. You can never know who's writing at any point in the book because they traded out the chapters and they wouldn't tell you, well, this is Jim writing now or this is Phil writing now. They were one year ahead of me in seminary. If grace is true, they write from the perspective that grace is true, by the way. They share a story about Jerry Falwell. Maybe you know this name an evangelical preacher from way back in the 70s and 80s has a university in Liberty, very theologically conservative. In an interview, he was asked this question. What if your son came to you and said that he was a homosexual? Now, whether you agree with the beginning part of this answer or not, my friends don't necessarily agree with the theology of this answer. Some will in this sanctuary agree with Falwell's starting point. Many in this sanctuary will not agree with Falwell's starting point, but this is what Falwell answered to that question. I'd say to my son that I don't think that's right. But then I would say, Go on to your room. This is your home. All the resources I have are yours. I will not reject my son. My friends who don't agree with the theology of that answer on the front end respect the back end of that answer. They think it's great. They are parents themselves, and they can't think of anything that would make them reject their children. You who are parents may know that great love as well. Maybe you don't know anything that would make you reject your child either. They say, how much greater is God's love for God's children than a human parent for his or her child. Can you even imagine? A little later, they tell the story. One of my friends was getting ready for a big to-do, a big affair. They had to dress up, and it was the whole family. So they got their son ready first. And as children will, he got bored waiting for his parents to get all gussied up. He was begging to go outside. He was in his dress clothes. After several times of asking and finally the parents saying, it's okay, but you have to be good and you can't get dirty. We're leaving in just a few minutes. I'll be good, I won't get dirty. Three minutes later, the doorbell rings. A neighbor is standing with a child who is covered in mud from head to toe. Is this your child? 
No. He wanted to say. But then he said, Grace won out. Yes, this is my child. He took his son upstairs and gave him his second bath that day, redressed him for this fancy affair, and then began to think about God's relationship to us. When we live poorly, He said, my son being dirty and needing to be cleaned up didn't diminish my relationship with him. It showed more how much dependence he has on me, how much more he needs me. Think about our relationship to God and those words. In the moments that we aren't perfect, it doesn't take us away from God. It reminds God and us how much we need to depend on the one who loves us, who forgives us, who comes to us in every moment, the one who shows us compassion Frederick Buechner tries to define compassion in his book called Wishful Thinking, A Seeker's ABC. He says, compassion is sometimes the fatal flaw. Compassion is sometimes the fatal flaw for feeling what it's like to live inside someone else's skin. Remember what I talked about? God being a part of every one of us. Maybe that's where God's compassion comes from. God lives inside of us. He also says that compassion is the knowledge that there can never really be any joy and peace for me if there's not any joy and peace for you. My friends ended that chapter in their book by saying these things. The Holy One never comes in wrath. The Holy One only comes in love. This is the message of the 11th chapter of the book of Hosea from the words of the prophet who speaks the words of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God that we do not have to be perfect and that God will still come to us and be gracious and kind and compassionate. Thanks be to God that as we receive such good gifts, that we can also share them with a world who is in need of knowing. Grace, compassion, love. May we so live. May we so live. Amen.
Please be seated as we gather around the table. Some will call this table the table of love. Some will call this table the table of grace. Both are appropriate, for it is here in this moment of the service that we remind ourselves of God's great love, of God's love for us. We remind ourselves that we follow the one who called himself Christ, for we are Christians. We come to this table with our joy and our sorrow, and we lay ourselves bare before our God. Come to this table with all your joy, with all your sadness, with even your guilt, and let God wash upon you, remind you of your dependence on God, and if you will follow the analogy, make you clean, bring you to wholeness. All who call upon the name of Christ are welcome at this table. Come and be fed. Let us pray. O oh God, our creator, we thank you for all that is good in our lives. Many treasures tempt us, and we think that in them we can find value for ourselves. At this table, help us realize that your love is the only treasure that lasts, the only treasure that can give our lives true value. At this table, we eat a simple meal, a little piece of bread that surprisingly is all we need. In it, we celebrate your feast, a feast of love with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Lord, we continue to thank you for the cup that you offer. We thank you for the grace, the compassion that you show us in your ultimate love. Love that you would allow your son, your only son, to die on the cross for us. Lord, we just praise you and just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. And after the meal, he took wine and he blessed it. And he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. Let us so remember the one that we call Savior, the one who is the center of our faith. As Christians, let us share this holy meal.
come to our sharing of our tithes and our offerings. Will you pray with me, please? God of grace, it is our delight and devotion to give these gifts to you. All we are and all we have are yours alone. Accept this joyful offering as a token of our abiding love and use it to bring peace, justice, love, and comfort to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Father Almighty, you have given us many blessings. We come to you today in thanksgiving, and our hearts look heavenward. You have showed us what it means to be generous, and we want to pay forward to our church. And may we be good stewards of everything you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn was the same as our opening hymn. Just the last two verses. We'll sing verses four or five of um, hymn number 23, Praise my soul, the God of heaven. This is a time of preparation to go forth from this place, to go into the world, to be loving, compassionate followers of God. Let us prepare to live so. If anyone, as part of your faith journey, would like to become a member of First Christian Church this day, I invite you forward as we sing our closing hymn, again, number 23.
a reminder that we have a congregational meeting to discuss one matter. Patty said it will take 15 minutes. It will take less than 15 minutes. Um, and so we're hopeful that you will remain for that. Even if you are a guest, you're more than welcome to that. But as we um, come to the end of our service, those of us who are members, please be seated. I will, in fact, ask you to be seated for... Go ahead. You can sit down now. It's all right. For the benediction and the post-salute. Our mission statement reminds us that we are to receive and share the love of God, but let us also receive and share the compassion of God. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.